but they will come in and I'll never forget I was on the Yoga Creek fire in Montana so I'm up here on this ridge line cut in line and all of a sudden I hear this noise and there's always a lead plane to these super liners when they come in so it looks like easiest way to describe you know what a, a Learjet looks like right yeah. so a small like corporate jet so you'll see something similar to that come through as the first plane and once you see that you're like oh the well, big one's it's coming get real. big <laughs> one's coming and right behind that you'll see the big jet come by and it was below me i'm at the top of this ridge line and there is an airliner i mean it is an airliner below me and it's just dumping and it's unreal and these pilots and they just push up and they go over and it's like how the hell do you <laughs> like that's unreal like that that takes some some guts to drop an airliner in <laughs> in a valley in a valley yeah, yeah. um God. I will take off the sunglasses after we do this. Yeah, I'm going to do that. It's already starting to yeah, strain. It's, yeah. it's weird. It's so is dark it, in Is here. it pushing it in as well? Yeah, it, it also, it's like, yeah, the headphones are kind of crimping into the... Yeah. Yeah. And so, Whitney, <coughs> correct. Yes. And you are with Hella Gunner. Yes. I'm and the director of operations for Hella Gunner. Okay, cool. Yeah. As you can tell, we are here at Lethal Weapons, Texas. We don't normally dress like that. Actually, Ike, do you normally dress like that? Not typically, no. No. Only on Tuesdays. I've got my, I'm going to show my new knots and my socks here. And and Ian was kind enough to lend me a revolver, so I've, <laughs> I'm full dad in it. If I get killed in the streets later on today, it's all his fault. But we've got Whitney here from Hella Gunner, and you are the... I am the director of operations. Director of operations. I'll go with chief as well. That's, that's there we good. Go. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. like chief, were you a chief? No, I was actually commissioned officer. Okay, awesome. So if you will, go ahead and tell our, our audience a little about yourself and a little bit about Hella Gunner. And if we think of any questions while you're doing that, we will definitely ask. Sounds good. So a little bit about me is, well, I'm Whitney. I'm the director of operations for Hella Gunner. And my background information is I served in the U.S. Army. I got out in 2017. I was an Army aviation officer, so a helicopter pilot. Specifically, I flew the Apache. I don't have any cool combat stories, though, to give. Um, I never deployed overseas, so all of my time has been in garrison. When I got out in 2017, I came out and I'm like, what am I going to do? I was part of the drawdown period, you know, where they're like, we're going to get rid of 34,000 people. And I was one of those junior aviators where they're like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, <laughs> thanks for playing. Um, here's your honorable. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? You know, my husband was still active duty, also an Apache pilot, but he'd been around for a little bit longer than me. So, of course, he got to stay. I'm not bitter about that at all, by the way. <laughs> but um, so I came out and I was like, what am I going to do with my life? You know, this, this isn't quite what I had originally planned. I wanted to be a lifer. And I started volunteering with an organization called Team Rubicon, okay. a veteran nonprofit. And they told me about this opportunity to go into wildland fire. I'm like, wow, that's never something that I had considered at any point. And um, gave it a try, ended up falling in love with it, and then spent the remaining four years as a wildland firefighter with the U.S. Forest Service. Oh, cool. During the off season, I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do to preoccupy my, my time for the other six to seven months? And I started volunteering with Texas Search and Rescue. And it was in Texas Search and Rescue that I was going to go down for my first like orientation training, and I get this random call right from this guy who's like hi you know my name is jeremy stillman i'm running logistics for Texar. i see in your profile you have a truck can you drive a trailer i'm like i'm, I'm sorry what who, who are who are you again <laughs> i'm like well yeah I, I can i can drive a trailer he's like okay well can you come meet me at my shop i'm gonna hook up this trailer and you can bring it down to where you're gonna be doing your training it was a Texar trailer so i'm like okay well you know i want a good reputation with this organization i met Jeremy and we started talking. He's like, wait, you were a helicopter pilot. I go, yeah, yeah, I was. I had just got out at this point. I'd only been out for maybe six months. And he's like, I have this company called Heligunner. Would you be interested in coming and like flying and doing aerial gunnery with us? Like you'd be a perfect fit. And I'm like, well, um, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll come and check out your operation. You know, cause I, I wasn't sure what I was going to be walking into, you know, my mindset was all military based. 
now to see these civilians who are doing aerial gunnery with helicopters i'm like i don't have any idea what to expect and i went out there and we had this beautiful md 530 fox orange uh, little bird helicopter is you know what we call them in the military and they were sh teaching civilians aerial gunnery i'm like i love this this is awesome and, you know, they also do hog hunting. And so during the fire off season, I started off as a flight safety officer um, with Hella Gunner, you know, teaching people the ins and outs of how to shoot from a helicopter, making sure they didn't shoot my rotor blades off a helicopter, <laughs> and then got into the operational side of the house. And so last year was my last season with the U.S. Forest Service as a wildland firefighter, and I stepped up and took up the director of operations role. Very cool. That's yeah. cool. I want to touch on a few things that you brought up. Absolutely. So, yeah, I've got questions. Yeah, you've got questions. <laughs> so many questions. And, and I want to go back because so uh, prior service army, mm -hmm. all right, worked in, uh, hand in hand with Apaches as close air support. I was infantry, Love it. squad leader, section sergeant, all that, all that good stuff. Uh, so what made you want to go when, uh, so you went to college, mm -hmm. right? Were you ROTC program or anything in college? ROTC. Okay. And then what made you decide that you wanted to go into flight? So when I was younger, originally, now, there's some people are going to listen to this and be like, okay, what, what, is, what is going on with her? I originally wanted to fly Blackhawks. I kid you not. So I read the book, Black Hawk Down, okay. saw the movie. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Because <laughs> I knew I wanted to serve in the military and I liked flying, but I didn't exactly know what that was going to manifest in. So originally I wanted to fly Blackhawks. And... My sister ended up becoming engaged to an 11 Bravo, and I spent a bit of time around the infantry. And I heard all of their stories from a different perspective. You know, they talked about the Blackhawks and the Chinooks, but boy, did they love those Kiowas and those Apaches. And they referred to the Apache as their guardian in the sky. And I'm like, I love that. And I just love the community. And so I'm like, you know what? I don't want to fly the Black Hawk anymore. I want to fly the Apache. I want to be that guardian in the sky for the infantry on the ground. And so kind of fast forward that to a little bit. I was sending care packages to single soldiers overseas. And at this point, I'm finishing up with my associate's degree. And one of those soldiers I had sent a care package to happened to be a single Apache pilot. Didn't know it at the time, but this man would end up becoming my husband because we just started, you know, conversing and, and talking. And he kind of further guided me into that, yeah, you know, this is my world. I think you'd be perfect for it. And I fell in love with the community because every airframe has a different set of personalities. You know, your Chinooks are a little more of their laid back, you know, go with the flow. And then you've got your Apaches who are your your for chargers. I'm like, yeah, no, this, this is my group. These are my people. And so, yeah, infantry actually was originally why okay. I went in. Fantastic. Yeah. And what, and what year did you graduate college mm -hmm. and then go into flight school? So I commissioned in 2013, got out in 17. So when I was part of the drawdown period, I was a junior officer when I got out. Okay. So drawdown period. And, yeah. But and, ROTC for two years. Okay. Prior. And where were you stationed at, if you don't mind? So I was out of Fort Rucker, Alabama. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you went to school there, stayed there, and just... Yep. Okay. <laughs> and then drawdown happened, pink slip, and here's your honor roll. Thanks for playing. I'm like, man, I don't really feel like much of yeah. an Apache pilot, but... <laughs> yep. And then what did you do? What exactly as a helicopter pilot, unless you got something... No, no, go ahead. All right. As a helicopter pilot... What did you do for the forestry service? Because that sounds really cool. I, that was my as question. As soon as you said that, like, <laughs> I was like that sounds smoke jumper, yeah. dudes flying out of the, the, the airplane, mm -hmm. going back country firefighting, doing yeah. that type of stuff. So what did you do? So this is going to throw a wrench in your whole thought process. So when I came out of there as a junior officer, junior pilot, I was low hour, right? Because at that point, I didn't have any combat tours. You know, I didn't really have any long field problems as an aviator. So it's like, okay, what can I do with the hours that I have, mm -hmm. right? So when I came out to the Forest Service, initially I was part of a type 2A initial attack ground crew. So when you go back and say, hey, I love the infantry, being around the infantry, all of a sudden I'm with the Forest Service version of that. <laughs> and I'm with 
nothing but guys on the crew on the ground. And so I started my time with the Forest Service actually with the guys on the ground, cutting line, running saw, and learning the ground mission. Eventually, I transferred over into the helicopter crew member side of things, but never actually flew. And that was one of the reasons when I was in the Forest Service, I'm like, okay, I want to get into this world, but I have to build hours. And I met the director of flight operations out of DC. And she's like, hey, how about you transition the planes? And we'll get you flying the otters so you can bring smoke jumpers in. So one of the things I'm doing right now is transitioning over to the fixed wing side of the house. So mm-hmm. I will be returning, but bringing smoke jumpers in from planes. That's cool. Yeah. So from like a pilot side, how, how different is it flying a, like a helicopter versus a fixed wing? I had all sorts of bad habits I carried yeah. over. So one of the most interesting things you'll see from a helicopter to a plane is takeoff and landing. Your visual reference is completely different exactly the opposite so when i'm taken off from a plane i'm nose high if i'm taken off from a helicopter i'm low and then vice versa and so it took a minute for me to develop a new sight picture because i'm like this just feels all sorts of wrong you know and also just how i handled like my coordinated turns were different um helicopters also you're always constantly engaged you know there's always something to do in planes you kind of find yourself getting a little bored like wow this really (laughs) does want to fly itself and if there is something like i lose my engine i'm not like a brick falling from the sky and another rotation i've got time yeah (laughs) i can glide you know and um it's it's fun they're two very different worlds though i will say that that's really cool yeah so your time in the forestry service um where I guess, were you like all over or was there like a geographical area where you were like stationed or how, do, how does that work? So in the fire side of the house, um, instead of deployments, because for them it means something completely different, it's, they call them dispatches. So I dispatched all over the country. Um, I spent a lot of time in California, Montana, Idaho, Washington, Colorado, and Wyoming. And so we would have our designated region And we would try to stay in there, but if the fires got bad enough and your own region was pretty sound, they would send you off somewhere else to help assist with some of the big fires. Like, unfortunately, California and Colorado had massive fires going on, especially California. Yeah. Yeah. No surprise there. A little dry there. (laughs) A little dry. A little dry. Yeah. So, so So you're currently with the Forest Service still. Last year was my last year last with year. them. Yeah. Okay, but you said you were transitioning to, so is that something you're going to still work on to do smoke jump? Yep. Yep. So I just have to finish my flight ratings okay. and for the fixed wing side of the house and then transition back over there. Oh, very so cool. So it's a going to be a two to three year tactical pause, if you will, but I'll be returning back over there. Nice. All right. That's interesting. That's cool. Yeah. That's the, what's the coolest thing you did in the Forest Service? <sighs> Honestly, so... Because I never got a a combat tour or anything like that, the closest thing I can self-reference is going out onto these these fires. And when we would get to these big, big fires, um, you never know what you're going to expect. You could be cut in line all day. You could be mopping up so in the black, making sure there's no hot spots that are going to come up and, you know, get behind the burn. And you can also do structure saving, you name it. You never know. So... One of the coolest things I I got to do and the the experience that really resonated with me is I was on a big fire up near Yosemite and this was in 2018 and it was the Ferguson fire and it was a big, big fire at the time, the biggest in the state. And we went up to this neighborhood, right? Um, And it wasn't like a traditional neighborhood where the houses are all stacked up next to each other. They were a bunch of like cabins with like one to 10 acre plots and there were so many residents who were like they were retired a few of them retired military and they're like these are our homes you know this and they were trying to to save their homes and a lot of people told me you're surrounded by wood you know um the odds of survival if the fire comes through here like yeah. there's not much we can do and unfortunately one of the things we have to do is analyze which structures we can probably save and which ones we probably can't so if we're on a time constraint there's some we've got a triage kind of thing. exactly exactly like a triage and figure out okay we got to focus our efforts here because we just don't have the manpower to go and 
we focus for several days saving these structures. And so when the fire shifted and moved through, like saving their homes and then being able to see people be able to move back into their homes and just the gratitude, like for me, that was the coolest thing. It's like, this is someone's home. You know, this is their life. And a lot of the time the States, not to pick on California, but sometimes they'll keep people in an area up until the very last minute. And so they don't have a lot of time to grab anything, you know, and all of their possessions, like, photo albums and stuff you don't think about so to be able to save like their lives like to them that's everything yeah and that's what i love the most like that's what carries with me i gotta do some cool stuff too but saving people's homes like that that was top that's pretty legit yeah that's really i had no i had coming into this interview like i I had no idea what to expect and then when i met you for the first time i was like okay because this is not what i didn't expect a, a a a female to show up this morning because we were driving around last night and look, look at everybody here. And this is a predominantly male event. Yeah. And this is, I mean, flying helicopters is a predominantly male, um, occupation. Mm-hmm. And then when you started getting into what you did, I was like, Oh, this is going to be so cool. Cause you, you, you're one of one of one of a, of a very small population that is getting out and doing this. And I mean, how many, female helicopter pilots are there in the forestry service. There can't be very many. There's not very many. I think of all the times I have worked with helicopters. So it, I would get the calls like, Hey, we're coming in to drop a Bambi bucket. We're going to hand them over to you. And it's like, okay, well I know how to talk pilot. I can walk them in, you know, it's not just like some ground guy on the ground. Like, Hey, I'm (laughs) I'm trying to lay you in, you know? Um, I think in my four years of fire, Maybe two, maybe two I've spoken wow. with. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, so, so you're re- really a pioneer in that field then. That's really cool. That's really cool. We, uh, I have two small children, two, mm-hmm. two little girls, and we're always focusing on the things that they can do mm-hmm. despite what everybody says they can't do. And so I thank you. Hi. I appreciate it. We actually have um, one of our flight safety officers. Officers, she's standing over there. She's prior service herself. I'm not going to drag you in here. You're, you're good. You're good. She's looking at me. She's, she's shaking her head. She's like, Whitney, I'm going to kill you later. Um, so Army officer, same thing. When our ROTC unit graduated, we had four female officers of my entire class who graduated. And how, many, so, how many were in that class, just for a reference for the folks Oh, gosh, walking? I'd say probably – almost 30. Yeah, about 30. So we had four and we had some phenomenal women. Um, one of the other girls from our class, she was a combat engineer and she was actually the first female platoon leader for combat engineer corps. And she went to Sapper school too. Like she's a legit badass. And so it's pretty neat. So for your two daughters, there's so many leaps and bounds for females. I mean, even in the military, our other, um, flight safety officer who's going to be coming out here later this afternoon. Her name was Nye and she was the first female NCO to go through infantry training. Oh, wow. fantastic. Yeah, and so when, she, when was that? So gosh, you'd have to ask her that question. Um, this probably would have been what, three years ago. I think they started opening it up, but she's going to have all sorts of stories yeah. to tell. She's, she's a legit badass as well. I, awesome. I've been out for a minute. So I got out before you got in. Mm-hmm. So I've been, I've been out for a while now over, Oh, well, 10 years in October. Oh, wow. So yeah. it's, it's been a minute, but that's fantastic. So fast forward a little bit. Okay. Past that, you started working with Heligunner. Mm-hmm. And tell us a little bit about what y'all do right now. Yeah. So Heligunner started off with aerial gunnery operations. So Jeremy Stillman, who's the owner, uh, primary owner of Heligunner, he taught Texas DPS their entire aerial gunnery program. He set it up, oh, wow. worked with them. And made it happen. And so at the time, there was hog eradication also happening in Texas, but it wasn't open to the public, right? That didn't come until later on when it was passed into law. And so Hella Gunner was there helping Texas DPS with their aerial gunnery program. And then I think it was 2012. Don't quote me on this. I might be wrong. But I think 2012, it came into law where we could finally do hog eradication. 
from a helicopter civilian side. And so then Heligunner became one of the first civilian companies to have hog eradication or hog hunting as it's commonly known um, for civilians. And so we did that for a very long time, aerial gunnery, hog hunting, aerial gunnery, hog hunting. And then last year, um, and we also did some tactical response as well. So we would send in helicopters and we would do tactical training, search and rescue as well, because you know Jeremy was with Texar for a very long time. And what's Texar? Texas Search and Rescue. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm going to drop these acronyms. Yep, we'll oh, no. It's a military <laughs> in me and it's, it's in there. But, um, acronyms all, all around. Yeah. And so then last year, we started doing something a little different. Um, we incorporated corporate team building. Now you're going to be like, what in the world? Where does that come from? But we use military simulation missions to do that. Oh, wow. And so last year, we did like our first few runs with corporate team building, running civilians through. We have pyrotechnics, military vehicles, air support from our helicopter, and we run them through four mock military missions. One of them is a night raid with um, two Army combat veterans who are operating as squad leaders or platoon leaders, depending on the side of, of the corporate. But it's so much fun. You know, we give them these missions. We'll do like mock IEDs, mock gun strafing runs, you know, with our pyrotechnics. And we do corporate team building now, too, with Milsim. Very cool. That's cool. Yeah. It's a write-off. Yeah. <laughs> right? There you go. Is that how you, how you work it? Yeah. We get with the accountant and write it off. <laughs> We're good. Yeah. So we'll what, circle back on that. Yeah, we'll <laughs> circle back on that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to you offline. Well, that's interesting. So with the hog, hog eradication and the hog hunting, mm -hmm. go into the hog hunting program a little bit. What do y'all do on that? How, do, how does that work? So we have arrangements with several different property owners throughout the state of Texas. They'll either come in and they will pay for us to come in and eradicate hogs, or we have a deal with them saying, hey, if we have clients who want to hog hunt, we'll let you know in advance, can we use your property? And one of the great things about that is we're not married to one particular area. We mm -hmm. can operate statewide and it gives us different hunting areas essentially, because there's sometimes you'll go up and there's always that worry of, okay, we've eradicated, but we've eradicated so well. <laughs> yeah, we're too effective. <laughs> we're too effective. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have different properties we can operate on. If you are a property owner and want to eradicate, we can either come in and eradicate for you, or, you know, we can have a similar service where it's like, Hey, it's just open. So it doesn't cost you anything. If we have paid clients to come in and do that. And we have a bunch of different aircraft that we can use from the R44 that we have here at lethal weapons to the MD, if you want to use that as well. And yeah, we run just suppressed rifles and we just, we have a good time, especially with hogs. Have you guys ever done hog hunting before? Not, not, from, from, a helicopter. not from a helicopter. <laughs> so the funniest thing happens, hogs run in the line. So if you're in a helicopter and you have an AR and they just pick up and they start running in the line, you just come to the very back of the herd and you just start making your way right on up. And we can eradicate like 200 plus hogs in a single night. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a good time. It's a much different experience. Yeah. So at night when you're night hunting, you're using white light and lasers or NVGs and lasers. We can or? do either. Either. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so we can also hog hunt during the day. It doesn't have to be night, but they're more active at night. They are yeah, more active at it's night. Cooler. It's also, yeah. yeah, it's cooler. It's a more pleasant experience. <laughs> Everyone's happier. So well, at night for the hogs, they're not quite as happy. Yeah. So at, at night, is everybody under knots? If you're, if you're doing total blacked out, is that, so how does that work? Our pilot is, um, we do have a hookup or so if you have knots that you want to use yourself, you can, or we've had people do both. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's going to be a preference thing because some people, they get motion sickness under mm. nods with the, with the moving, you know, aircraft. Yeah. So yeah. we can do either one. That's cool. And if you're doing white light, then mm. everything's just. And which we can, cause yeah, it's eradication of a, an invasive species. So that's cool. Yeah. How long does like a typical excursion, I guess, last? Like if you're, if you're going to go up, how is that like a two hour deal or five hour? About deal? four to five hours. Gotcha. Yeah. And if there's like any weather coming in, we always brief in advance. So it's like, hey, you know, weather, we might have a delay to make the entire experience a little bit longer. Fortunately, dealing with aviation assets, that's part of the package deal. But yeah. And y'all have a, what are y'all doing out here for, uh, for lethal weapons? I know you have a bird over there. Um, yeah. 
Yes. So we are conducting aerial gunnery um, out here at Lethal Weapons. So we have five steel targets. Um, so Jeremy, one of his other companies he owns is AR-15 Targets. Mm. And so we've got some of our steel targets out there on the property adjacent to here. And we're running people with our suppressed, you know, ARs, just having a good time. Very cool. And it's just like a, a down and dirty <laughs> into our aerial gunnery operations and so it's it's a really fun experience and everyone's in costume yeah pretty much we had someone dress as a ninja yep, yep. I saw, i've seen two ninjas out here and i kid you not so he asked us he's like hey can i throw a couple of ninja <laughs> stars and we're like we have never been asked this before it's like th- thought about for a moment it's like we can hover yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's do this. We're not retrieving them, so once these are gone, I mean, we'll retrieve yeah. them on the backside when we get the targets, but yeah. that's like, you know, that's just part of the job. You y- know. Y'all got that on film, right? So we had a little bit of a delay today. He's going to be out later this afternoon, but yes, it's going to be on film, and I'm very excited for it. Yeah, that's going to be great. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't even, like, because there's, you know, you, you start, we, we talked about how, like, unique of an experience that you've had, but like there's a lot of people that have never flown on a helicopter. I never have. And and then you get the people that have flown on a helicopter, but maybe you've never shot from a helicopter. Right. And then you compound that. Have you ever hunted hogs at night in night vision from a helicopter? Have you ever thrown ninja stars? Right. (laughs) I I didn't even know that was like a thing that I am very excited about these ninja stars. I'm like, man, this is, it's an experience. Yeah, that's that's going to be you do, uh, definitely on the bucket list. You know, we've we've joked one of our uh, our warehouse supply specialists or uh, Justin. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the guy that has the big tech shirt on and looks like Jesus. Um, Gun Jesus, as yeah. he's known in our circle. Yeah, um, but he's a pilot, and so we've always kind of joked that it's Ike's personal pilot. But that's I mean that's one up. We, we've never thought about throwing ninja stars from. The- <laughs> we've had some interesting things in our birds, so we will use people's personal. Firearms, if we pre-approve them, biggest thing is suppress, and then where the brass goes. Yeah, uh, can't have it kicking back in. And we had we we're out the Gundy Awards what two weekends ago, and we had Dylan Precision out there, and they had their blacked out saw, and they're like, "Hey, can we take this?" It's like, "Yeah, we can make this work." And so we <laughs> we had their blacked out saw up there, and it was a it was a good time. So we see some interesting stuff too. So. We can't make special accommodations for everyone, but as long as we can do the brass deflection, we, we can accommodate quite a bit. And how many, so th- for the, what model do you have out here and how many people can it carry? So the R44, it's a Robinson uh, brand helicopter that we have out here. If we have a good density altitude, um, so we can get a lot of power, we can sometimes accommodate two shooters, but with the R44, it just usually doesn't have the power for that. So it's usually one shooter at a time. And there's always a flight safety officer on board in addition to the pilot. So that's one of our control measures. Um, just because systems malfunctions and stuff happen, you know, with the firearms. So we always have a flight safety and then a shooter. Gotcha. Um, we don't do two shooters at the same time for our aerial gunnery program as far as shooting at the same time typically. But that's also so we can just maintain a positive control because I, I hate to say it as as veterans we have this this bad habit of trying to bring that barrel up because that's you know it's our workspace we mm-hmm. bring them up so we have to keep the barrels down and <laughs> that's out. where the rotors are yeah that's where our rotors <laughs> yeah. are please don't shoot my rotors but yeah so usually it's just one shooter a safety and then the pilot and sometimes we'll have a videographer or a photographer up there as well um, if if we've got the power allotment for the day cool and that's based off your atmospheric conditions and your Mm -hmm. and just the weight and balance as well so if we have if we want to put like a videographer in there what we'll often do is run a few iterations so we've got the um primary and auxiliary tanks a little bit lower so we can incorporate a little bit more weight in the aircraft as well that's because every pound counts right every pound counts and y'all determine that as that uh, even leads to your flight time right Mm mm-hmm Yep. So we have a weight and balance calculation sheet. So we always get the weights of all of our shooters and we tell people like, look, especially Lace, like this is not personal. <laughs> this has a point. Yeah. And so um, we'll get the weights and then we have the weight of the fuel, the pilot, the, you know, the shooter, and then of course the aircraft. And so we can adjust the CG limits um, accordingly because if we are too heavy, our CG is going to be thrown off and we're just also not going to have the power to, to take off and operate safety. So we 
keep up on all that and it's always adjusting throughout the flight but we have it down to a science so yeah now is is hell gutter only in texas do y'all only operate in texas or so we actually operate nationwide um next month we're going to be heading out to cameo shooting complex in grand junction colorado we'll be conducting five days of aerial gunnery there three days is going to be with a girl in the gun national i was going to say is, is that very cool yeah so we'll be out there and um recently we are actually working we'll be conducting aerial gunnery as not part of but adjacent to the tactical games oh and so we're going to be next weekend over at texas regionals in florence texas conducting aerial gunnery on site but we will also be conducting aerial gunnery at several of the other facilities nationwide as well very cool that's cool all over the place all over the place is this something that operations wise you're like okay y'all are continually ramp up is this all these like working with the tactical games and working with events like this is that something that you're is new or is that something that y'all have always been doing for as long as hell gunner's been around so we've been working, uh, shooting events throughout Texas for quite a while, but Tactical Games is a new relationship with us, and same with out here at Lethal Weapons Texas and working with, with Clay and Tony. And so we're wanting to ramp up and kind of branch outside of the traditional like three-gun shooting competitions, which are great, or two-gun shooting competitions, which are also amazing, and just kind of go to different venues and have different experiences, like coming out here where everyone's in uniform, like <laughs> of their own choice, like it's amazing. And so we are changing things up a little bit. Like the Gundy Awards we were at, it was our first year we were there and we were operating with drive tanks. And I'm like, this is amazing. I'm like this, we're coming back annually for this. And so we're changing that up a little bit. And then with the military simulation, that is new for us. Um, We've done corporate team building events before, but always just on the aerial gunnery side of the house. So now that we're actually running a program using military tactics and team building techniques that's new for us and um it's it's kind of exciting so hella gunner is definitely morphing into something different from where it started which was texas dps and hog eradication with the state do y'all still do work with dps or um is that jeremy does um a bit of work with them and he maintains really close relationships with actually a lot of law enforcement agencies um like remrock um, pd we've done some work with them before and some other agencies and we're actually just coming up there's a cinco de mayo event that's coming up where we're working with a law enforcement agency that does a a charity it's a charity run for (laughs) oh man i'm going to offer you one though (laughs) Uh, that's good thanks that was if everybody didn't see that that was the number one surefire salesman in the country <laughs> which means probably the world yeah yes yeah aaron v sells more surefire than anybody else thanks to big text ordinance <laughs> dot com dot com man and he brought ice cream that yeah, is, he he's a key he's the man he's a good dude yeah he's a good dude not saying i got off track there for a moment but man guy brings your ice cream it's like i need someone like that <laughs> he's a good dude we keep him around for um, oh and we have a beard now tony's dragon. looking for his uh his, his bearded his reptile he's he's hanging out we've had him on the <laughs> podcast he's gonna be our next guest um so that's really cool so with the events and stuff like that you're doing, like if I wanted to go shoot, do aerial gunnery out here, what is the cost on that? So it's two ninety five right now, and you get two twenty five round magazines. So you'll get two passes at our five steel targets that we have in place nearby. Very cool. That's, it, that's pretty dang reasonable. Yeah, yeah, it's really not that bad. And that's why using like the R44 compared to the MD, it increased the cost a little bit. So. Uh. It's our more cost-effective option to give people that taste of aerial gunnery. That's cool. And what about hog hunts? How's, how's that work? Is it all time-based? or? So it's, it's going to be time-based. So it's that four- to five-hour block. And usually we start about 4500 to 5000 depending on which helicopter you want to use. And so the price packages aren't quite fixated because it's also going to depend on fuel at the time. So roughly ballpark, it starts about 4500 and then you can have two shooters. Yeah, it's about a five-hour, um, I guess, experience. Mm-hmm. It's, it's cool. Do you, yeah. Can you rotate shooters out on that, or mm-hmm. can you? Okay. Yeah, so um, when we have the two shooters, so like when we run like the MD, we can actually have both shooters going at the same time on oh, that. Right. Awesome. And uh, I do see y'all on, on YouTube doing some videos on there. 
of y'all up doing the aerial. I don't know if I've seen that. I saw the hog hunting videos yeah. that y'all have had up. If you can, do you have any clients that you can say that you took up? Anybody cool? Well, we've had some cool ones. Unfortunately, I can't. We signed non-disclosure agreements okay. for okay. most well, of them. But we, we've had some really, really great ones. Um, the one I can talk about because he talked about was Tim Kennedy was one of our clients. Oh, okay. So. Yeah. Fantastic. And we do work with corporations um, for the aerial gunnery side of the house that I can talk about, like Red Bull and Dell. We've, we've oh, worked very with cool. them too. So. Oh, yeah. And Dell's just right there in Round Rock. Yeah. So, wow. That's the full spectrum. Yeah. Dell and, <laughs> and Red, Red Bull. Bull. It's totally. Yeah. You know, Red Bull will jump a, a river on a, in a Subaru if they yeah. wanted to. And I guess hog hunting is not. Yeah. Anything too far gone for them? We haven't done hog hunting for those two companies. Those just the yeah. aerial gunnery okay. side of the house. Yeah. Yeah. When you said the corporate uh, team building, I, I imagine like the the whole you know Milsim kind of thing that'd be pretty popular. It'd be a pretty cool experience for a lot of these. Yeah, definitely to being able to adapt and offer more services that you can spread out uh, to people that can you know there's only a certain amount of people that can afford the aerial hog hunting. Yeah. Uh, so being able to open your clientele base would be pretty good it is and with the corporate team bill inside of the house we have lesser packages for our milsim so we've actually done um bachelor parties oh where they're like hey can we do your milsim experience but make this a bachelor party i'm like yes absolutely and i'm still waiting for the bachelorette party side of things though i yeah. i really want to run some ladies through there and so far that we haven't awesome. <laughs> but i would love to um so we can also do specialty experiences like that now for the aerial gunnery What's your limitations or your requirements on space for the range? It's going to depend on how things are laid out because the angle that we're going to be shooting at, the earth is our backstop, right? So mm -hmm. we don't need high berms or anything like that. We can have an open flat field, which is actually what we have out here. Um, we've operated in areas as small as, oh gosh, about 30 to 40 acres upwards oh, wow. to 18,000 acre facilities. It's really just going to depend on one, how it's laid out and two, what's nearby. Mm -hmm. um, if we've got like a bunch of residential neighbors, you know, nearby a 30 acre, you know, plot, obviously we can't do that. But if we've got the room to do it and what's adjacent, we can work with a lot of different sites. And we've actually worked at a lot of different facilities as well. Um, Copperhead Creek, we've been out there a few times, Revelry Peak, Liberty Hill, We've operated out of all of those. That's that's really interesting. So, like, when you're shooting and stuff, about how high off the ground are y'all so typically? So, if we're in a flat field, gosh, we're maybe 30 to 50 feet. We're, oh, wow. we're, we're pretty low. Yeah. Um, if we're operating at a higher altitude, so, like, when we are in Colorado, for instance, we're at a high D8 anyways, and we're also at a high altitude. Um we might keep it a little bit higher, closer to 75 feet, but we're normally pretty darn low. Yeah. And why, and, and explain why that is, why you have a higher operational altitude at a higher above sea level altitude. So part of the thing is going to come down to is if I lose my engine. So like, let's say we've got the R44, or the MD, those are single engine aircraft. We have to be able to safely land in the event of an emergency. So like engine failure. It's going to be at the discretion of the pilot based on the density altitude. So colder, colder air is more dense. Helicopters, planes like to operate in colder, more dense air. We get more efficiency. If it is hot and humid, it's more sluggish. We don't have as much. Um, so we might not be hovering as much. So we might be moving a little bit quicker. We might be at a higher altitude. Um, if we're operating in like Colorado, for instance, we have the topography, right? So we are in kind of like a canyon almost. We want to be at a higher operation level than we would be out here in the flat field because it gives us more margin to go into a safe landing area if we have to like auto rotate. And that's going to be at the discretion of the pilot at the time and what he or she feels comfortable with. Does that's that make cool. sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so what is your role as a uh, director of operations? What do you do at Hell Gunner? What does that make up for? Yeah. So I train all the flight safety officers. I also coordinate all of the events. I do all of the planning behind the scenes and the logistics. So anything that is operation related, that is me behind the scenes. Logistics, planning, making stuff happen, making it happen. <laughs> I wear all the hats. I wear all the hats. Jeremy does a lot too. Don't get me wrong, but I I wear 
a bunch of different hats. I also take on the marketing as well sometimes. But we also have a great videographer and photographer who gives us good content too. And so do you, do you still get a fly? Do you get a fly with Hell Gunner? So I am too busy to fly most of the time, but I will do ferry flights. So when we're taking the helicopter to and from, so like Colorado, I'll be flying from here. So out of Georgetown all the way up to Grand Junction. Oh, very cool. Yeah. How, how much range does one of those um, helicopters have? So it's going to depend on which one in particular we are using and if there are extended tanks or not. So like with our R44, I mean, we'll typically run about two, two and a half hours before we need to refuel. Um, sometimes we can get closer to three, but closer, closer to two. What kind of ground speed can y'all get with those? If we have the doors off, we're going to be capped out at no more than 90. So like we have all of our doors removed right now for aerial gunnery. So no more than 90. That's what it, that's what it states. So that's where we keep it at. Um, if we're cruising though, we're going to be closer to the 110, 120 range. If we have our MD, we can go a bit, a bit faster, but typically we're cruising between 90 to 110, depending on which aircraft we're using. Now, why does the doors being off or on affect what speed you can go? So it's a structural thing and it, okay. it's honestly, it's the aircraft designator. So whatever the manufacturer recommends. Mm -hmm. So like when I was flying the TH-67 as a training aircraft in the military, um, the military version of that was the OH-58. It's really just a Bell 206 Jet Ranger. And I believe we were also capped out at 90 with the doors off. And it was always a structural thing. It's like, oh, the manufacturer says for structural integrity, can't operate faster than this. And I think a part of it is it's keeping the aircraft in trim. So if you keep it out of trim and you have the doors off, you get like that buffeting and it becomes a very obnoxious experience. So that could have something to do with it, but that's more of a manufacturer question. And sometimes we look at the manufacturers like, I don't know why you make these choices you make, but okay. Right. Somewhere, okay. somewhere <laughs> it went a hundred with the windows down and it was not good. Yeah. yeah, some, right, we, yeah. We, we, we lost some here. I guess yeah. it's like when you roll your back windows down yeah. and the car starts, <laughs> you know, and you got to crack that front one. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I will say anything more than 90, it's like, no, that that's pretty good. Cause you get that buffeting and you're like, oh, this is, this is a, it's not a pleasant experience to have. I had somebody once tell me that flying a helicopter is like trying to, what did they say? It was like try and fly a plane while standing on a basketball, right? Because your feet are always doing something mm -hmm. and your hands are, is that, is that close to being correct? When I first went through aerodynamics um, at Fort Rucker, we had this guy who was teaching the class explain it as, think of a tornado that's trapped in an elevator shaft. It's like, that's what flying a helicopter is like. And I don't know, that always resonated with me because helicopters, you always have to stay engaged. And depending on what it is you're flying, you have some aircraft that are just really finicky. So like the 530 Fox, um, the MD, it is such a powerful helicopter. It's got power for days, but any input you make, you're already leading with the counter input or else you're going to be overflying the thing. Um, with the Robinson, it's a little bit more forgiving unless you're trying to hover. Then of course you sneeze and it, it does its own thing, but yeah. It's, so depending on the helicopter is the shortest answer, um, is going to be the flyability if it's really finicky or not, but it's nothing like a plane. Planes want to fly helicopters. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds. You're beating the air into submission. Yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. That sounds sounds kind of scary <laughs> but it's fun it's so much fun do you've got anything queued up oh so i want to go back to like the the firefighting side of it yeah. so like on the news and stuff like you most of what you see is like you know helicopters like dipping into somebody's pool and picking up water and stuff is in actual practice is it more of that or is it more you know cutting your line breaks and you know and, and stuff like that what's what's like the actual reality of you know um wild firefighting so depending on the environment that we're in, um, there's kind of a running joke with fire. It's like fire never s seems to start in flat open fields. It's always in the ugliest <laughs> terrain you can possibly imagine. Uh, the rockiest hills or like the most dense brush field, if it is a field at all. And so we tried to bring in aviation assets right out the gate because the volume that they can dump on the fire 
can be a game changer of whether we are able to catch it or not. We have the hand crews in cut in line. And I mean, when you're cut in line, like when I was on the fire, it wasn't uncommon to be out there for 12 straight hours and you're just cutting line. Um, but there's only so much work we can do on the hand crew. You yeah. Know? Um, we can cut line all day, but the dozer can come in and do five times the distance oh, yeah. that we can easy, you know, in the single day aviation assets are the same. Um, they can come in, they can stop the fire before it even gets spread outside of, you know, 20 plus acres. So we tried to get them in as quickly as possible, but depending on where they're located, we might not be able to, and all you have might be a hand crew out there and maybe some engines as well to come out there. Um, but some of the big fires, yeah, aviation, we get the super tankers, which, I mean, you're looking at them, you're like, that's a, like a passenger jet, you know, a big like triple seven or something like that. And they, they're unreal when they come in. I don't know if you've ever seen those pilots, but they will come in and I'll never forget. I was on the Yogo Creek fire in Montana. So I'm up here on this ridge line cut in line and all of a sudden I hear this noise and there's always a lead plane to these super liners when they come in. So it looks like easiest way to describe, you know what a, a Learjet looks like, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. So a small like corporate jet. So you'll see something similar to that come through as the first plane. And once you see that, you're like, Oh, the well, big one's it's coming. To get real. <laughs> big one's coming. And right behind that, you'll see the big jet come by. And it was below me. I'm at the top of this ridge line and there is an airliner i mean it is an airliner below me and it's just dumping and it's unreal and these pilots and then they just push up and they go over and like how the hell do you <laughs> like that's unreal like that that takes some some guts to drop an airliner in <laughs> in a valley in a valley yeah Holy cow. um so you'll see them you'll see a bunch of helicopters jumping or dumping what we call bambi buckets and yeah they will go into pools and in California, you see that a lot because the water lines of some of these like alpine lakes and stuff, they're either non-existent mm -hmm. or they are down low. And when you get low enough, you have like old trees and stuff because some of these are man-made and you don't necessarily want to drop a bucket in there because you don't know if it's going to get stuck on something. So yeah. Yeah, they'll take from people's pools, you know, whatever you need. And it also is turnaround time. Sometimes they're just closer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we see a lot of aviation assets on those bigger fires, and we try to use them as much as possible. Them and bulldozers. Yeah, they're be, be worth their weight in. Clear massive amounts of land in a short oh, yeah. short time. Yeah, they're incredible, and those dozer operators—they're also a whole different breed. I mean, you'll see a fire like right up coming up on them, and they're just sitting there, just dozing away. Like, oh yeah. man. Are there anything special they do to the dozers? Is it just like a off the the line cat, or do they like make them? I guess, like, build them out specifically for firefighting service or? Honestly, most of them are contractors. Gotcha. Um, and sometimes they are so desperate to get them out there that they don't really care. Yeah. And they'll just call all sorts of people to come in from private owner operators to, you know, bigger construction companies to come out and they'll lease those dozers out there and run the line. And so mm. I've seen all sorts of configurations out there. The uh, Sam Houston crew. Mm -hmm. They were at our neighborhood for one of those like days where you can take the kids around and touch a truck or whatever. And they had a dozer out there, oh, and, nice. but it was all, all decked out on the inside. He's like, he's like, we can sustain like 15 or 20 minutes of being like on fire oh, wow. before it's like, you're done. Yeah. But it was really cool. So the audience really wants to know, why did they call it a Bambi bucket? <laughs> so I honestly don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, I have asked this question a couple times and I've gotten several different answers. Some person said it was the original manufacturer. It was the acronym for it. But I, for the life of me, cannot figure out exactly <laughs> what in the world that would be. Yeah. So no, that is a fantastic question. And I have not been able to Because you said that. I was like, I wonder if at some point in, in the past, <laughs> oh, oh, if they scooped up some water <laughs> and there was a deer in it and yeah. it just ended up bad. Because that's, that's where my mind automatically goes to that. Nothing would surprise me. That's, would surprise that's me. fantastic. So most likely it's an acronym though yeah. of some sort. Unfortunately, because so, it'd be a lot cooler if it was the it, other way around. It would be great. Um, favorite airframe <sighs> to fly. Why would you ask me this question? Because it's Why? or top five. Because yeah, I googled <laughs> top five questions to ask a helicopter pilot, and one of them was top airframe. No, I'm kidding. I didn't do that. Okay, so. <laughs> uh, Obviously, the one that I flew in the Army is my favorite, but my second favorite is the MD. I 
love flying that helicopter. It is so much fun. You think, and it's already doing what it is you want it to do. It is so incredibly responsive. Um, planes? <sighs> planes are planes. I don't really have much of a preference there. I've flown high wing variation, so like a Cessna 172 Skyhawk, you know, it's like the Honda Civic of the sky. And I've flown the low wing, so the Archer uh, 2, which is made by Piper. I don't really have much of a preference there. And I'm going to have some people listen to this and they'll be like, you're either team high wing or you're team low wing. But I think it's they're, because I started as a helicopter pilot where I'm like, eh. They're all boring. Eh. It's just a plane. Yeah. There's some things that are a little bit different. Um, just characteristics, flight characteristics. Like the Cessna, when you go to do a stall, it's very violent when it kicks over. Compared to an Archer, it's like, oh. And it just like settles <laughs> Like what? This is it? Like this? This is all you did? But no, no real preference. So, I'm not taking the easy out here, though. I'm promising you. <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find information about Heligunner? So you can find us online. Our website is just www.heligunner.com. So we have all of our product information, service information on there. We also have links where you can book for services, whether it's corporate team building, specialty events, so like a bachelorette party. I'm telling I just really want this to happen. I'm going to plug it. And yeah, same with you can be the first, the first bachelorette party. Same with our... We need our, to make it happen. Our, our hog hunting. Um, but we also are on social media, so we are Hella Gunner on Facebook or Hella Gunner Actual on Instagram. Nice. And there's, a, there's a funny story behind that. So we lost... We had one employee who f forgot the rescue information for that Instagram page and all the login information and Instagram will not give us back that page. Oh, so yeah. Nope. The, you're hell, done. Hello, Gunner Actual. That, that is our Instagram. Well, if you've got any questions or uh, comments, just leave them down in the comments and we'll, we'll get with Hell Gunner and get them at, answered or go to their website for any information that you might want. And I think that's around yeah thanks thanks so much for coming on this was very very cool episode. very definitely the first helicopter pilot that we've had yeah on the on the show it's no very pressure. interesting no pressure at all thank you very much thank you very much for having yeah, me we appreciate awesome. it and thanks for tuning in listening watching whatever you're doing please leave us a five-star review on itunes and all of that stuff thanks thank for watching you.